This is Craig Blumenshine from Wyoming PBS. Governor Gordon is almost ready to begin his, what has become a daily media briefing this week from the Capitol here in Cheyenne. It will begin momentarily. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is our last uh, conference this week. Thank you for bearing with us uh, for four uh, days this week. It's a very exciting day. Happy, happy May Day. Today is the day we've opened uh, several businesses statewide, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about all the excitement that's going on uh, again, I, I hate to keep asking for your uh, patience on this, but we are working as quickly as we can, and I know many county health officers uh, have had a lot to do over the last couple of days. But again, it's May 1st, um, and, and before I begin, uh, let me just, uh, yesterday I made a, a comment about fishing licenses and, and, and the 14-day quarantine, uh, and I I uh, heard from an outfitter yesterday, when, when I said the word I did, which was inconvenience, I really did not mean it was a light thing. I know outfitters are having a tremendously difficult time, um, and, and I wasn't saying that. I really was just saying we're trying to get back working as quickly as we can. The outfitting uh, part of our, of our industries, for tourism especially, are extraordinarily important for Wyoming. So apologies for that yesterday. Uh, but I want to thank you again for joining us, um, and we've provided a number of daily uh, updates this week. Next week, uh, probably happily, you'll go back to a, uh, a more relaxed schedule of updates unless there's something that comes up uh, that we need to communicate with you. Uh, but today I am again joined by uh, Dr. Alexia Harris, uh, and, and I want to thank her for her diligence and her team's diligence as well. As you are well aware, today is the first day of our modified public health orders. We had more than 500 attendees to the webinars offered by the Wyoming Business Council this week, and we are happy to report that early indications are that our business community is complying with the public health requirements, and they're open and operating, and I know they all care about the results. And I want to thank them for that, and I want to thank them for their, for their patience. Uh, it is indeed an exciting day uh, in Wyoming. I do want to talk a little bit about some news we can offer on unemployment benefits, CARES Act funding, and Small Business Administration Payroll Protection Program. I also have uh, Dr. Harris here to provide a brief COVID-19 update. Uh, but today, the Department of Workforce Services began accepting unemployment insurance applications from those who are self-employed, independent contractors, gig economy workers, and those who have exhausted their regular and extended benefits. And again, the Department of Workforce Services began accepting those unemployment insurance applications uh, today. The program is part of the CARES Act and provides up to 39 weeks of unemployment insurance benefits for these workers. I do want to remind those watching that the Small Business Administration Payroll Protection Program is still accepting applications and funds from the program have not been, have not been exhausted as I speak. I spoke with uh, Auditor Racinus last night, and I can tell you that uh, that program is still going strong. Loans can be up for two months of a business's average monthly payroll costs from last year, plus an additional 25% of that amount, up to $10 million. Many Wyoming banks and credit unions are reporting that they have received loan approvals from SBA for nearly all of the PPP loan applications that they've had in their pipelines. And they are accepting new applications while funds remain available, and there are funds available. 
If you are unsure whether your business qualifies, it is not too late to speak to a lender. And I want to speak a little bit about CARES Act funding and about a phased approach to spending the $1.25 billion that Wyoming was allocated. And before I do, I want to thank our delegation for being our champion in D.C. It is truly extraordinary. We have the leadership we do in D.C. And so Senator Barrasso, Senator Enzi, Congresswoman Mancini, thank you for that. This morning, I laid out my plan to the Legislative Management Council. It's over here. And the way I began that this morning is I said, let me begin with some assumptions. In mid-March, starting just a couple of days after session end, the country and Wyoming experienced a catastrophic loss of business activity, which resulted in an unprecedented destruction of demand affecting our most valuable mineral sectors and many of our largest taxpayers. This was further exacerbated by a number of hopefully temporary health restrictions designed to help Wyoming people prepare for what could mean to be, could have become an onslaught of cases that would have overwhelmed our health care system. Dr. Harris did an exemplary job of keeping those uh, systems very much intact, and these measures have been mostly successful allowing us to ease some of the restrictions as we have today carefully. Workforce is workforce. Business requires a good workforce. And workforce needs jobs. We have a great workforce. We want to make sure that we have a phenomenal economy. And so part of what I'm talking about here today is to make sure that our workforce is protected and our businesses are ready to go. But recognizing that the combination of global pandemic and local measures had severely reduced economic activity, CARES guidance was provided for the CARES Act by Treasury. The guidance is vague, but the penalties are very high if we don't allocate that money correctly. Wyoming was very fortunate, thanks to our leadership, but I suspect that means the scrutiny on how we use those funds will be very high. And no doubt that heavy scrutiny can become even more pronounced in, under a partisan microscope. States elsewhere are already deploying CARES Act funds. Idaho yesterday issued $300 million, reducing the probability, and I, my point is that this reduces the probability that our guidance will change over time. There may be some more money on the way. The use, we must use this money valuably, but it needs to be used quickly because people are hurting today. So I've recommended that we not wait long, but that we pace ourselves so that we make the best and most valuable use of it. These are exceptional and unprecedented and thus call for exceptional and unprecedented and hopefully unprecedented setting, setting handling of these funds. I'm happy to have the opportunity to work with the ledger, legislature, but I want to make these, sure these funds are nimble, targeted, and trackable. And because of the audit potential, I remember my dad's admonition. He had a favorite, favorite Ogden Nash poem, here is a good rule of thumb, often too clever is just dumb. So simple, understandable, purposeful, so we don't have to pay either penalties or fines down the road or the principal back. These CARES Act funds have to be spent in this year and properly. So let me speak a little bit about the CARES Act and what we've recommended. This is what I recommended to the legislature this morning. That we have three phases for this money. 
We put the bulk of it at the beginning because the businesses that need those funds, the workforce that needs those funds today, absolutely need them immediately. Because if we don't use these monies immediately, we may not have the business or the workforce down the road to be able to make use of the funds later on. So in our phase one, we recommended emergency response, and that's the whole range of everything from uh, what counties and towns have to worry about to uh, other aspects. It's an emergency response, uh, workforce issues, ways to uh, retrofit the way the state does things. Health preparedness, obviously what we need to do to help health care providers, health care institutions to do a better job. The business support that you see up here is what we'll talk about as we go on. We wanted to talk about unemployment, and, and unemployment will be addressed in this phase one. Evictions and the challenges there, and as I've said before, we need to focus across both landlords and tenants to make sure that we raise all boats. And food banks, and here I want to give a shout out to my wife and the Hung Wyoming Hunger Initiative, which is just doing extraordinary work. But we have much, much more to do. Phase one would be effective immediately and would have a large chunk of this money, $575 million. Phase two, which is also ready to go as uh, from, from today, is available for the reimbursement of COVID-related expenses for career, or excuse me, uh, for counties, towns, and cities, and special districts. Those funds have to be submitted from the counties or towns, and, and the COVID-related aspects have to be indicated, uh, and then we would reimburse those out of, out of this phase two funding. An effective July 1, any of these, some more funding would be available if necessary to keep on uh, keeping our, our businesses going and our employees working. Phase three, which comes about later in the summer, uh, would be a continuation of those programs plus any of the programs that the legislature works on over the next couple of sessions uh, so that we make sure that we use this money wisely and that we target it for the purposes I'm about to, to talk about. So the next slide, please. We're going to talk about business support in our proposal for the legislature. It is to establish a direct grant process to provide relief today to Wyoming businesses employees during the COVID-19 crisis. Small business administrative assistance, uh, this economic in, uh, injury disaster loan, uh, payment protection program, uh, all together, this is what uh, we have been able to put forward so far. Next slide, please. This tells you how important our small businesses are in Wyoming. There are 20,558 employers. There are 279,140 jobs, $3.3 billion in wages, and an estimated $370 million in sales tax. It's important that we hit Main Street. The bars you see on the left talk about the size of our industries and the number of industries that we have for each sector. This effort would be targeted at our smallest employers, but also at those who've been uh, somehow left out of the Small Business Administration's PPP program. Next slide. This is our proposed timeline. SBA assistance uh, will be ending in May. In June, the Wyoming-led grant program would move forward, first tranche of $225 million through July, the second tranche leading on. These monies have to be granted by the end of the year. Next slide. We want to assist those businesses that did not receive SBA money 
and we want to make sure that we keep Wyoming businesses viable throughout the duration of COVID-19. And why I say it's so important that we put these funds to work immediately is because we are starting to see our country come awake again. We want to make sure our businesses are ready to meet that challenge and move forward with that challenge. This program, if implemented correctly, and as I said, unprecedented, uh, in an unprecedented way where we're working together with the legislature, it will provide uh, that we can be nimble if allowed. And the reason why we want to be nimble is because every day these things change. Congress comes out with new programs, new things arrive, and we can redeploy these monies relatively quickly. Targeting with flexibility, we can better respond to this ever-evolving situation. Tracking executive and legislative reviews of effectiveness with absolute transparency so that the public of Wyoming knows where and who these monies go to. Teamwork, without the help and support of the legislature, we cannot accomplish this. And that is why I'm so glad to live in the state I do, because Wyoming, we work together. There is a separation of power between the executive and the legislative branch, but legislative and executive branch all understand how important it is that we meet the needs of our people today, not tomorrow, not next year, but today. So with that, I want to change the subject and, and introduce Dr. Harris to provide an update on and some perspective on the new public health orders that went into effect today. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for being here. Thank you, Governor Gordon. We've had to make and will continue to have to make some difficult decisions during this outbreak, and I want you to know I very much appreciate all of your support. It's been an interesting path. Just a few short weeks ago, we were hearing from many people that we weren't doing enough, and now we're still hearing from some of those folks, but now more people to seem to be saying we're doing too much. All along, we've been trying to find the right balance. I think our actions have largely been effective, and that's part of the reason why people, or why it can be difficult to understand why we still need caution. That's always the case with prevention. If it works, people often say, why did we even need to do that in the first place? Today is the first day for some of our initial steps down that forward path we all want to follow. For many reasons, um, the governor and I have both talked about this week, our first steps forward needed to be smaller steps that involve lower risk and fewer people. We simply don't want to unexpectedly find our state in a worse place than we are in now or have to go backward because we went forward too quickly. We're still in a pandemic and we need to see how this disease may progress overall and in Wyoming. Our current number of laboratory confirmed cases is 420 plus 146 probable cases. We've had seven reported deaths and estimate there are 12 current hospitalizations. The updated statewide public health orders that went into effect today are setting the baseline for where we believe most of Wyoming should be at this point. Countywide variance orders may be requested by county health officers after working with people within their communities and with county data in mind. Variances are essentially countywide replacement orders that may be less restrictive or more restrictive. County health officers also have a role in approving exemptions to cover individual businesses and specific activities. I approved a countywide variance requested by Teton County to be more restrictive than the statewide orders. It made sense for them. In Park County, a small adjustment to allow outdoor dining made sense for them. I expect that there will be other requests that make sense for other counties. I will give each request a fair review, but it, I may not approve them all. For some, the timing and circumstances may not be right. We are hopeful that we can move ahead with more flexibility in the statewide public health orders after this set expires in two weeks. But I would caution against making assumptions or setting expectations that certain things will definitely happen at that point across the state or in specific counties. We simply have to see how things go before we take the next jump forward. The safe path ahead, I hope for us, involves thoughtful and measured actions and involves all of us working together. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, and, and I do want to particularly thank our county health officers. They are uh, right in the middle of, of all of this, 
Uh, there have been a couple of rumors, as would be expected, uh, that, uh, you know, the state health officer isn't going to look at uh, countywide plans, isn't going to take any of these exceptions. Please know that is not true. We are going to look carefully at each plan, and we're going to be very thoughtful about that. Patience is really a virtue. It is really a virtue at this time. We all want to get back and running. I started this conversation talking about how important tourism was and one element of tourism was to our state. It's one of our most important legs of our economy, certainly the largest employer. And those are the employees that have taken the brunt of this. So we want to make sure that we come back, that we have a way to have the robust economy that we really need to have to move this state forward. So again, I appreciate your care, your time, and respect your patience and understand your anxiousness, but just bear with us because we are getting there quickly. And we're getting there talking about what the next steps are for restaurants, what the next steps are for faith groups, and so on. So thank you for this. There are a couple of submitted questions from Nick Reynolds at the Casper Star Tribune. Enrolling out the grant funding program you presented to Management Council this morning, are there any specific, specific accountability measures you would put on companies to ensure the money goes directly towards supporting employees, or would large-scale employers like those in energy be given wide latitude to spend these dollars as they see fit? Uh, Nick, uh, thank you very much. Um, about uh, uh, there's more. Is there more to that? Just a second. Um, thank you very much for that question, Nick. Uh, the the point here is that this is an adaptable program going forward, and I think it's easy on first blush to say, you know, these people are good, these people are bad, uh, and and what we want to do is to make sure that we have a highly accountable program, that we know the money goes to supporting employees to make sure they're still on the payroll and they're still being paid. Uh, and we want to make sure the bulk of that money goes to small employers. But just yesterday I was talking to um, uh, one of the coal mining companies that uh, is really trying to do their best to keep employees on. Um, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what we do, but one of our concerns is we don't want to lose our mining communities as we start to see volumes come back. We want to make sure our oil field service people are, are still in business. We want to make sure that our tourism industry still has people that work there. And why, that's why I said as one of the assumptions, workforce is workforce. Uh, and it's important that we make sure we re maintain that workforce. We are not interested, and one of the things the state can do, probably better than almost any other, is that we can, we can know, look in the eye of the person who's asking for that money and know what that money's being used for, and more importantly, track it more closely. The second question, uh, is this the question from... Oh, from Nick, a second question. When asked about possible gap, gaps in Wyomingites' ability to access health care, you said a solution would be likely a policy decision that goes beyond the role of the executive branch. While the legislature has considered a number of solutions before the crisis, like the possibility of Medicaid expansion to bridge some of those gaps in access, is there any specific policy you would support from the legislature? Is there anything you would not support? Nick, I think all things are on the table at this point. We want to make sure our Wyoming citizens get the chance to get the health care they need. Uh, I've certainly said before and will say again, my concern is that we not build in an escalator that we cannot afford over time. So in talking with our legislators and in talking with our programs, I think there are menu choices that can be developed, and certainly this is going to be an issue for Wyoming going forward. Uh, so I look forward to having a very robust conversation on, on the, the types of uh, possibilities that we can uh, do uh, to, to bolster health care, make sure we have affordable and accessible health care throughout the state. 
From Maggie Mullen, Wyoming Public Radio, the governor has said that Wyoming is better situated to recover from this pandemic in what ways? Well, Maggie, I have to say uh, thanks to the really good work of uh, Dr. Harris um, knocking on wood, we uh, seem to have uh, really weathered the storm somewhat better than others. Um, we hope that stays the case. It all depends on what people in Wyoming do from this day forward. Um, but we feel that Wyoming uh, is well positioned, especially if we can put our uh, plan to work here and get those funds out to make sure that our workforce stays and our businesses are uh, up and running, that we can adapt quickly to changing business conditions. Wyoming is in better fiscal shape than a number of other states. And um, one of the reasons why I am not terribly confident about uh, additional changes to this CARES Act funding is there is some discussion about you know, which side wins under, under changing circumstances. So I think this, um, our, our situation being somewhat more robust uh, financially with a fairly good uh, rainy day fund allows us to consider our, our options as a state better. Most re uh, another question, most retail and restaurant workers don't have paid time off. So if they stay home because they're sick, they're also foregoing pay. Does the governor have concerns about that? Uh, Maggie, I, I do have concerns about that. Uh, and I have to say those are, those are the kinds of programs that we have. There are some exceptions in the CARES Act, but at a state level, those are policy concerns that, again, really are guided by the legislature. For Dr. Harris, there are a couple of questions for you. One uh, from Reese Monaco with Cowboy State News Network uh, and KFBC. Some clinics in the state are doing antibody testing for coronavirus. Are these tests benign given to the Department of Health? Oh, being, sorry, <laughs> given to the Department of Health. And what are you doing with them? What information will the test provide? And if someone has antibodies from coronavirus, and has already had it, how likely are they to catch the virus again? Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, yes, we are aware that there are some clinics in the state um, performing antibody testing for coronavirus. Um, I've said it before, but I'll reiterate um, just that we have to interpret those results and use that type of testing with caution. There's still not a lot of data yet about um, how good those tests are at detecting the specific antibodies against um, against the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 and not other types of, of similar viruses. And they should not be used um, by themselves um, to test whether somebody is infected um, with the virus that causes COVID-19. You still need to do the, the nasal swab um, to make that diagnosis. Um, but those results are um, being given to us. Um, we have systems set up um, to receive most of, most of these results um, automatically from hospitals and, and laboratories around the country for Wyoming residents. Um, and so we get both negative and positive results for those serology tests along with the um, molecular or the, the nasal test. Um, there are some smaller laboratories where we may not get all the negative results, so we're exploring ways to increase the number of results that we're getting. Um, you know, what information do the tests provide? It does depend on, on if it's a good test. If, um, if it's a test that really tells us that um, we may have specific antibodies to this coronavirus. Um, and if that's the case, a positive result could mean that um, you've been infected with the coronavirus either now or in a previous time. So how we're using them, um, again, as I mentioned last time, the, the case definitions from the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, we investigate all positive tests. Um, if someone had just has a positive antibody test and is symptomatic, we are going to recommend that you get that nasal swab and get that molecular test to see if you have COVID-19 um, that's making you sick um, at this time. Uh, what we don't know yet is what having antibodies to coronavirus means. We don't know yet if that provides you immunity um, from second infection with coronavirus. That's something that needs to be studied and, and will be studied over the upcoming months and years, um, but it's just not something we know yet. 
Thank you. Are there questions from the phone? Yes. Well, this is Mark Bentley at 307 Net Radio in Buffalo. Hi, Mark. I understood you uh, talked to my wife today. Uh, yesterday, actually. Ah, okay. It was a delightful conversation about the uh, food program. Very good. Agriculture, agriculture has taken a pretty significant shot, and it's one of our key industries. Some may or may not be COVID-related. Some of it may simply be market-related. Are they in line for any of the the funds that have become available to help retain these industries? Um, Mark, that's a that's a very good question. The COVID uh, specific funds uh, are you know need to be COVID related, uh, and and so that's sort of a challenge. But the reason I've recommended putting it in with uh, the, the business council to be able to sort of, uh, look at that program and who the applicants are is because we do have other mechanisms that can be helpful in those circumstances. Over the last year, I've made a couple of recommendations, uh, on things that because of Wyoming's particular set of circumstances with trust funds that have been uh, built up over the last few years, uh, several years, uh, with uh, mineral funds that, uh, y y you know, there are opportunities. We did this with the Goshen Irrigation District, for example, uh, where I recommended a bill that uh, takes a certain portion of the funds that are in trust and, and applies them to uh, essentially a catastrophe fund that uh, producers themselves can put into over time. Uh, and then working with rural development and others, we, we believe we can meet some of those needs. These are difficult times. Uh, I, you, you know, I've been talking to uh, Governor Nome uh, and, and understanding the difficulties that happened and attended the Smithfield plant uh, and also Governor Ricketts because they've also had issues in Nebraska and as has Governor Pollock in Colorado. Uh, you know, a lot of our meat packing uh, potential is really being compromised at this point and, and, and that will, uh, slow down, uh, the ability and, and therefore adversely affect agricultural prices. Uh, so we're, we're trying to work, uh, really regionally and, and nationally to, to figure out a way that we can make sure we have a robust, uh, process so we don't end up with those bottlenecks. Thanks, Mark. Thank Next you. question. Governor Ryan Robertson with Wyoming News Now. You had mentioned you're working on a plan for uh, houses of worship to open back up. My question is really simple. Why is it okay to go to grocery stores, hardware stores, that kind of thing? Even the mall in Cheyenne is open, but people can't go to church. Um, people can go to church. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we're working very hard on uh, coming up with the right kinds of requirements. I don't know, Dr. Harris, if you want to address uh, any of any of these concerns, um, but y you know, there. Um, w w what we believe is that uh, if we get county plans, uh, and I, Dr. Harris, will review them, uh, we have a, a path forward. So. Thank you. And um, you know, the reasoning behind we took the steps we did is that, um, you know, gatherings of people um, involving multiple people in close proximity with each other um, is unfortunately um, a very effective way to, to spread this virus to very many people at one time. Um, so the steps that we took initially were uh, steps that involved fewer people coming into contact with another with one another and these and the other steps that involve more people gathering with each other um, we envision later down the road um, because of their greater risk um, however as the governor said um, there may be places where um, based on the epidemiology or the um, outbreak situation at this time that that some of these types of gatherings may be more safe to have and we are certainly considering that in the in the countywide variances Uh, thank you uh, for that. Next question. Hey, Governor Gordon, uh, Governor. This is the Star Tribune. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Harris. Um, Dr. Harris, first, can you are there other, any other variances that you're um, considering right now? Uh, and beyond that, 
Can you talk about if any counties have submitted, you know, any other type of plan to guide their reopening or, or changes within their county? Yes, thank you. Um, so there have been other variances that have been submitted today for consideration, several of them, and um, I am reviewing them right now um, with the Attorney General's office. Um, and yes, uh, a couple of counties um, have also submitted um, their plans to me for reopening. Um, I haven't gotten all the way through them yet, but um, look forward to the discussions um, with those counties on their plans. Um, you know, we, we want them to be in line with, with our plan and what I've seen so far. They they really are, and a lot of hard work has gone, gone into those as well as collaboration across the counties. Um, so I do appreciate all the work um, that has gone into those and um, look forward to reviewing them in more detail. Can you kind of talk about what the difference between like a, uh, why counties need specific plans and why they can't maybe just follow the state orders? Can you kind of talk about why the plans are necessary? Sure, and I, I do think counties can can follow the state plan, um, but as you know, um, in many different counties, there are there are different uh, circumstances um, for for various reasons, and so I think you know the plans give them an ability to think through those um, unique or specific circumstances um, to think about um, steps or timing that might make sense for them. Um, so I do think you know we, we uh, of course have a state plan, and I think it's very appropriate for counties to follow that, um, but that for specific or unique situations, um, that it's also very helpful for counties to work with their partners to, to develop their own plans going forward. So I think both options are good. Great. Thank you. Thanks. A um, couple more questions. Hi, Governor. Jim O'Reilly, 99 Radio. Thanks again for the time. Um, uh, two questions. One. Uh, what are the plans for a special session? And two, an unrelated question. Um, a lot of talk yesterday at the news conference about using the word surge. Uh, that word was used by doctors at the hospital in Rollins yesterday as they prepare for a potential surge, which I understand modeling suggests that we are in a, a period of a surge between now and next week. Um, when we're talking about a surge, are we talking about secondary infections, um, original coronavirus patients becoming reinfected, or are we talking about new infections? And do you see the spike from this surge being greater than the peak we've already seen? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to let Dr. Harris talk about your second question and just uh, speak very briefly about plans for special sessions. We outlined a, a proposal uh, a little while ago uh, that uh, recommended an early uh, May short session uh, that would uh, have a couple of bills uh, like the one I suggested uh, today to the Management Council, and they've been working on most of the day uh, one or two bills uh, to, to go forward. Their intent uh, has been, and I don't want to speak for them, but certainly what they've voiced to me, their intent is uh, to try to get a couple of bills passed uh, that uh, try to, uh, as they've put it, uh, give the governor a bit more flexibility under the unprecedented circumstances of these federal funds um, so, that, so that we can meet the needs, as I say, of people who are really struggling right now. So to give uh, me a little bit more uh, latitude to be able to address those, what I was trying to do is to, um, you know, give them a, a little bit of the process so it wasn't just the governor is going to shovel this out. This governor understands that uh, we need to work together between the legislature and, and, uh, and the executive because, really, we both have responsibilities. The challenge is how do we get that done quickly um, and, and, and in a way that we can get these funds to people so they can use them quickly. Uh, then uh, there is some consideration about uh, them, uh, the legislature, calling themselves in uh, June for a, a longer session uh, to deliberate uh, and, and a number of other things like what are our um, revenues going to look like. And I will say, Jim, that uh, we there's something called the Consensus Revenue Estimating Group. 
uh, which is uh, it goes back to Governor Herschler's time. It was designed to not have either a direct executive or a direct legislative official function, but was designed to come together and understand what revenues would look like for budgeting purposes going forward. Um, they will not have an indication of what's happened to the, the economy really till about May 20th. And that means they won't have a really good idea about what's happened to Wyoming's revenues until a few days after that. Of course, Memorial Day, et cetera, um, Paul falls into that. Uh, so realistically, it will be sometime in June uh, when the legislature would be able to call themselves back in session. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have been instructing all of our agency heads to look for the places they can make uh, substantial cuts. We don't know what those are going to be, but we're trying to get prepared for the worst. Uh, so that's my answer to your question, and I'll give Dr. Harris. Thanks. So, so to ask, answer your questions about surge, um, so surge really does mean um, new infections, so people who haven't been infected before, um, so having a, a large group of people um, or an increasing number of people um, develop infections with COVID-19. From a hospital standpoint, you know, they need to be prepared, and I'm guessing this is what they were talking about. They need to be prepared um, to be able to to take or handle multiple COVID-19 patients at once. Um, you know, do they have the PPE available? Do they have the staffing, the the beds, the the ventilators that they need? And that's something that we're asking um, the hospitals and the counties to consider as they consider what might be appropriate for them um, in this in this variance process um, moving forward. Uh, you know, from a statewide public health standpoint, um, there's certainly a concern for um, as things sort of move back to normal, as people start gathering with each other more, that we could see an increase in the number of cases we're detecting, again, because people are having more, more interactions with each other. Um, you know, we saw this um, in past pandemic influenza outbreaks that this can occur. And that's one of the reasons that we are, you know, we're moving slowly and in a measured way. Um, moving forward to relax some of these restrictions um, to prevent this large increase in, in cases that we could potentially see. Um, and in terms of the model, you know, whether it would be greater or lesser than the, the peak or the number of cases we've already seen is, you know, is something that I can't predict, but certainly the goal of all of our actions is to keep it um, from being uh, larger than what we've already seen. Yeah, thanks, Jim, and, and yeah, I know you, you understand this and, and many others do. The dynamics of this disease have not changed. People don't know sometimes that they have it and they can transmit it. That's been one of our concerns. Indeed, that's one of the concerns that I've been trying to work back and forth with Governor Bullock and Cam Shawley of, of Yellowstone, just because there is uh, a, a, some concern about Who's going to come? How fast are they going to come? Where are they going to come from? Are they going to be infected? Will it overwhelm our system? These are all still valid concerns. So it's exciting to have, uh, you know, this opportunity to open up. But I think Dr. Harris is absolutely right. Uh, slow and steady wins the game. Now, um, one or two more questions. Well, hi, Governor. Uh, this is Billy Arnold from the Jackson Hole Newsing Guide. Um, I have two questions about opening up. Um, on the one side, um, if businesses are allowed to open but choose not to um, out of concern for if you're some other COVID-related concern, are they still eligible for their PPP loans? And then on the flip side, um, if a business does open um, and employees are asked to come back to work but choose not to for whatever for a COVID-19 related reason, related reason, um, does that mean that they are no longer eligible for unemployment insurance? Yeah, so the, 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 the two questions are one about businesses that don't want to open because of COVID concerns. Uh, we certainly don't want to force anybody to, to open. And the second was about employees who workforce uh, may be wanting to uh, uh, avoid putting themselves at risk. We had that similar question yesterday about an employee who was concerned about uh, being compelled to go back uh, to uh, work. Um, and, you know, we certainly don't, 
look, we, we want to protect people. We do not want to put anybody at risk or put them uh, in, a, in a condition where they feel like they, um, you, you know, are going to be put at risk. Uh, on the other hand, we also are going to start to see our economy recover. All of us have got to learn how to live uh, with, with COVID. Uh, that we're, we're, we're encouraged by some of the news stories that we've heard the last few days about um, possible ways to reduce the amount of time a person's in hospital and those sorts of things. Um, but that doesn't mean we want to be reckless. That doesn't mean uh, that we aren't, aren't going to be doing social distancing, wearing masks, uh, and, and doing some other things like that for, for a long time to come. Um, I think people are beginning to be aware of that. They're adapting their behaviors. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you, you know, as, as, as this goes forward, uh, we will find whatever that new normal is uh, and, and be able to work. Thanks for that. Last question. Thank you. Governor, this is Max Cotton with Wyoming News Now. Um, you mentioned when you outlined the uh, guidelines for uh, phase one of the spending the CARES Act money helping businesses, but what criteria will you do you want to see for which businesses qualify? Because obviously with the Federal CARES Act, there were some businesses that got money who a lot of people felt didn't need it or and then had to return it. So what are you looking at in terms of so we can get the money to people who need it the most? Right. So the, the second um, tranche of, of uh, the PPP program did allow for sole proprietors and some others to, to be able to take advantage of, of those loans. Uh, and that's why I'm saying we need to be nimble and adaptable to changing circumstances. Uh, but we want to be able to find, uh, you know, let's say restaurant employees, restaurant owners that have uh, really uh, borne the burden uh, of, of these closures in ways and may not be eligible for PPP. Um, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. That's why I've asked the business council to, to really dive deep using the lending community. We know now, having uh, gotten as many loans out the door, where the gaps are. Uh, our local bankers, our local credit union, uh, all have a familiarity with these business enterprises, and there, frankly, just are some gaps. We want to address those gaps. We want to make sure that Wyoming people uh, get the relief they need and get it quickly uh, so that they're not gasping for air um, and for crumbs at the end of this process. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. And so with that, I, I thank you again. Happy May. Um, please uh, enjoy this wonderful, great state. Thank you for your, your diligence, especially for the reporters and for the news media. Thank you for your leadership and the way you've conveyed this messaging. Uh, you, you've played an incredibly important role uh, in Wyoming's success so far. Uh, and uh, we, we hope to see that success continue. Thank you.